So, what do I really think about these things? <laughs> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with CircWorks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the underground laboratory where we create robots, aliens, zombies, and other imminent threats to humanity. And uh, what well, we usually do that today, I don't think we're doing any of that. I think because we're talking about pop vinyls today. Can you believe that? This isn't really a toy review channel, it's more of an art channel, but I do want to talk about pop vinyls. But before I do, uh, if you tuned into this video because you want to hear me bash pop vinyls, uh, you might want to hit that dislike button and kind of bail right now because when I say, when I said in the title, why do I hate pop vinyls, that's actually sort of a question for myself because up until now I've kind of, I don't, I, I don't know if I hated them, I just, I, I really didn't have any any, any investment in them or I just I, I didn't really care too much about them um, and uh, I until I saw this documentary on Funko and it kind of changed my way of thinking uh, definitely about the company and I, I didn't know much about the company there's certain things I like I love the reaction line that they have and other things but when I really figured out what the company was all about, it just really spoke to me and it gave me a new perspective on, you know, the whole collector pop vinyl thing. And uh, so I don't really have a lot of pop vinyls. I've got, these are actually my daughters. Um, so I bought a few of her, them for her and she's got some, you know, she likes to collect the Disney ones. Um, but I've got a few as gifts. I got the, these couple, a couple of these. Sometimes people give me gifts because they, they know I like Star Wars. Um, I don't know if these are considered pop vinyls because they're kind of the bobblehead, which is kind of where they began, uh, Funko began, and I want to talk about that, and that's kind of what, what got me into this whole, how it was built on nostalgia and everything, and it, this documentary that I saw, I think it's called, is it called The Business of Fun? I'll have to, I'll have to remember that and put a link to it, but it's on Netflix, you guys can check it out, I'm sure if you search Funko or whatever, you will find it on Netflix, but it's really, it's a pretty good documentary, and uh, like I said, it kind of made me think about pop vinyls and just you know, collectibles and things like that, and how it relates to art and all this kind of stuff and how it relates to kind of what I'm doing. I, I kind of was inspired by this uh, to do some things and rethink some things that I'm doing. But anyway, I'm gonna get to that, but I thought, you know, what, what would be cool if I could draw, maybe I'll draw like a pop vinyl. Um, and my immediate thing to go to is my little like mascot character. I don't know, this guy, the little, I call him a, a henchman, my, my Cirque Works hen robotic hench minions. And they're kind of the guys that help me out behind the scenes and everything like that but the weird thing is I thought well I draw that but then they don't really have eyes they just got the kind of the the, the hard hat and everything um, so and that's kind of what makes a pop vinyl a vinyl a pop or pop vinyls what they are is because they've kind of got the little shark eyes little black shark eyes um, so because you don't see I don't know how it would you know, I think it would just look like it regular like it does normally but at the risk of coming off as a little narcissistic uh, I thought you know what maybe I'll just do a self-portrait of me as a pop vinyl so I thought maybe that might be fun so I'll do that I want to talk a little bit about more of these little kids things and uh, kind of the company and and uh, Funko rather and uh, and yeah and kind of why I had to stop and think do I really hate these things or or is there something more to them I did gain a greater appreciation for them so I want to talk about that so uh, without any further ado let's get to it so I recently watched a documentary it's called making fun the story of Funko. It's on Netflix if you guys want to check it out. Um, but it really gave me a great appreciation for Funko. I didn't really know much about them. I'd seen the pops and some of their other lines and things like that. Some of them I kind of liked, some of them I didn't really care about. Um, but, but in learning about the company, how it started, the guys who started it and everything, it really connected with me a lot because it's similar to some of the things that I'm trying to do, you know, with CircWorks and everything and kind of capturing nostalgia and all that all that stuff. So so anyway, yeah, I checked out this bit and, and the documentary, uh, just a brief review. Um, for me anyway, I really love the parts where they, they talk about the formation of the company and how it got started and everything. They get into, you know, halfway through they start getting into more of the collectors, which I'm sure a lot of people will be into. That wasn't really my thing so much just because I'm not really a collector per se. Um, but it talked to some different people why they like Funko and all that kind of stuff. But I really was was really fascinated with how the company started and 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 what kind of drove them to create uh, what eventually became Funko and then the Pops and all this other stuff. But it kind of started off with these uh, little wacky wobblers. 
and what they they were just basically bobbleheads. That was kind of their first line, and it started off with um, I think the first one they did was Bob's Big Boy, and like my dad's a huge Bob's Big Boy fan. If you're not familiar, he's the mascot for a chain of hamburger restaurants, and he's got that he's got Bob's Big Boy stuff in his house and everything. He collects that kind of stuff, um, 50s nostalgia and everything like that. Um, and then I think they think they did what Betty Boop and everything, but you'll kind of have to watch watch the documentary. I don't want to retread a lot of what that's all about. But it did start off with these things called Wacky Wobblers and how they first got them into the store called Sparky's, which is on the Universal City Walk. I'm not sure if it's still, still there or not, but I remember very vividly going to Universal City Walk with a friend of mine who is a pretty, um, pretty successful voiceover actor. And he went in this store and he just started buying, like he just was dropping hundreds of dollars on all these wacky wobblers. He collects all this nostalgia stuff because he does cartoon voices, so he wants all these cartoon characters. And I, because before, when I start, before CircWorks Art Lab was CircWorks Art Lab, kind of the mad science thing, basically CircWorks was the company that I was doing freelance under and it was branded as CircWorks Illustration and Design with Character. Because what I would do is I would, um, I would just, Basically, what I offered was branding, but centered around like trademark characters or mascots. So, if you were a company and you wanted a character, I would create the character and brand around that. And that was kind of my thing. That's that's kind of what I specialized in. So, I was really big into you know and and like character mascots and things like that. So, these wacky wobblers that were in the Sparky store, uh, I went in with my friend. Like I said, he was just buying all kinds of these, and these are real cool. And I'm like. I don't know at this point if I can really afford to start collecting these, but it was they were really cool. I wanted to collect them, but because they had like all the old cereal mascots and stuff, all the Frankenberries and and you know Quisp and all these different you know Sugar Bear, all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, produced by Funko back then. I don't think people really knew the name Funko, but they knew the kind of the wacky wobblers and everything. But so that stuff really spoke to me. And because, you know, so I went out and rather than starting to collect, I'm not a huge collector just because I think that's a, a that's kind of, that's going down a path that would lead me to lose quite a bit of money or invest quite a bit of money in something like that. So what I started doing was I started buying books and things on like character mascots and I've got a few of those. Um, I probably should have showed some in the beginning there. Uh, but anyway, so, so based on that, I, I just started, you know, really kind of getting an appreciation and started collecting, you know, just either books and things on character mascots because that was what I was into and that's kind of what the business was back then. And I even created a website, uh, what was kind of a blog, it was kind of a blogger site I did way back in the days. And if I can remember, I'll leave the link, but it was called Character Confidential. It was kind of, in a way, it was just to kind of do fun articles, but kind of tie into what I was doing to kind of bring in clients and everything. But it was called Character Confidential and it was basically like these onion style articles, you know, humorous articles about mascot characters almost like they were real people in their daily lives like I had one where it was an article about how the Kool-Aid man was being sued for destruction of property because he keeps busting in and everything you know through the walls and I, I had a bunch of these sugar bear had stopped because they stopped using him on the uh, commercials for, for cereal, so he, he was he was moonlighting as uh, like a smooth jazz disc jockey or, or a quiet storm type disc, disc jockey because he kind of had that smooth voice stuff, just stuff like that. Um, so I was really into that. So when I started watching this documentary, it just that all kind of came together, and then I, I just really started to appreciate kind of where that kind of that transition happened. And they went from the bobbleheads, and now with this pop thing that's just blown up. And before with pops, I was kind of like, I've kind of, you know, I would go into conventions, and you'd see these huge walls of pops and everything. And for me, and I don't know if it's just kind of the punk rock mentality. And I was never like, I was, I was sort of into punk rock mostly by association because I had a lot of friends that were punk. But back in those days, I was more into like hip hop. But even hip hop back then. It wasn't like, you know, now it's like hip hop is just huge. Before then, there wasn't such thing as like a hip hop like radio station. It was all very underground and you had to go out and discover things on your own. This is before it kind of went mainstream like it is today. So it's kind of still that punk rock mentality where you would go into a store and you would just buy things sight unseen, album, albums and things like that and break them open like, oh, and you, it was kind of a sense of discovery. So I've always had that menta mentality. So when things kind of blow up like that, that, I kind of lose interest because I'm into just kind of discovering new things and that's why I kind of 
railed a little bit on fan art and everything. I do. There's fandoms and things I like. I don't want to act like I don't. But but to me, to me, I like the discovery thing. That's why I go out and search out uh, you know independent creators, people who might be the next big thing that might happen later. I want to kind of just be in that discovery place where I discover things before they go big. So. Once something becomes huge, like pops or whatever, I, I tend to lose interest in everything. But you know, but a lot of that stuff I do love. I love a lot of these characters and things, and uh, and that I don't know. This uh, documentary really kind of brought all that home. Another thing that kind of spoke to me in this documentary is just how, especially in the early days when they were showing, I'm sure they still do this, but they would have these release parties where they would release new products, Funko would, and they would just throw these huge parties or whatever, but even in the beginning, um, they would just have these get-togethers and they, you know, they gathered these fans, they were called, uh, it was, uh, Fanatics, you know, was kind of what the fan base is called. But it was really cool because they even in the beginning, which really spoke to me, is they did sort of this mad scientist themed uh, launch, and they were all dressed in lab coats and things like that. Uh, but I really get it. the thing that I really get into is like branding and promoting things and tying everything in together and just kind of making sort of a spectacle and kind of bringing attention to kind of what you're doing. And they're doing some things that, that I really kind of want to incorporate into, you know, CircWorks or kind of where I want CircWorks to go eventually with the whole mad science supply company and everything. Um, it just kind of gave me some ideas and I, I liken it, you probably, you maybe you've heard me talk about like another company that I look to up to a lot is Johnny Cupcakes where they've got their, you know, they sell t-shirts but it's all branded under Johnny Cupcakes. You go into their stores and it looks like a bakery but on the racks they've got t-shirts and everything. All they sell is t-shirts and apparel and things like that. They don't sell any baked goods except on April Fool's Day I think they did as a promotion but that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Just these crazy fun promotions and Funko was doing kind of the same thing and uh, I really I just really like that and and by doing that they they it was all grassroots when they started like I said they they started with Bob's Big Boy and back then no one really wanted to license Big but Big Boy it wasn't like a, a big thing and and when they brought it into the stores they're like yeah I don't know if these will sell but yeah, we'll try it out. And they came back and they had all sold out. And then, they, you know, same thing with, they, they would at first, they start to approach these licenses that, that weren't really big, that, but there were actually people that wanted them. And so they were able to get these, these inexpensive licenses. And I mean, if you look at what, you know, eventually what that became, I mean, when you look at Funko and the amount of licenses, I don't know that you can compare it to anything. I don't think any other, I, would not, I wouldn't even limit it to toys or anything. I don't think there's any company that has licensed that amount of different characters from different companies. Uh, I remember back in the day, now, I'll kind of, I'm going to go all over the place a little bit, but I want to kind of set up a point. So there's always people that say, are you a Marvel or DC fan? And, and for me, when people ask me, I'm like, I like them both. I like Marvel and DC both. And then people are like, oh, you can't like both. You have to like one or the other. But when I was a kid, uh, the thing back in the, back in the 70s when I was really little, the, the thing was uh, Mego, Mego Toys. And if you're not familiar with the Mego's World Greatest Superhero Line, um, they were one of the first companies, and it really hasn't happened much since then, except for maybe, I think Lego maybe maybe has license for both Marvel and DC. But most companies don't. Like, and you go into the 80s, I mean, Marvel had Secret Wars, DC had superpowers as far as the action figure lines. They weren't to the same scale. You couldn't play with them. But back in the 70s with Mego, they had licenses for both Marvel and DC, and it was under the same banner of World's Greatest Superheroes. So you could take Spider-Man, same scale as Superman, and you could play with them together like they were in the same universe. And I love that. And that's I think that's one of the reasons why I like... Uh, both Marvel and DC and like it, even one of the I've got a mural in my house that is basically Marvel on one side DC coming together all the same characters from when I was a kid so those Mego characters you know uh, kind of facing off and I just really kind of love that mural and, and I, I, I don't know who would win that battle I don't really care because I just something I like to see because I love those characters um, but anyway so there was Mego that kind of was one of the first people that kind of did that you know dual license with Marvel Marvel and DC and it really hadn't happened since but now like Funko 
I mean, it's just amazing. Not only do they have Marvel and DC and Disney, which of course is Marvel now, but I mean, I, you'd be hard pressed to find a fandom that they don't have the license for. And I'd be, I should do a little, I should have done this before, but I'd be curious if I did a re, did research to see who actually turned them down because I mean, there is everything. It's just astounding that they are able to, I don't know what their licensing department is like or who actually does the work or whatever or how they do it, but it's just really amazing that they're able to license that that, that diverse line of characters. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just kind of in awe on that. But it's but that's the thing. Whatever it is, and I don't know that I would, even though now I'm kind of gaining a greater appreciation for Funko Pops and things. I don't know that I would actually collect them, or I wouldn't collect them just to collect Funko Pops. I might there might be a particular brand that I might. Like I said, I got a few Star Wars. But the one thing I was thinking might be fun to do is because I've done like I would do like um, like. I don't know, you wouldn't call it cosplay because it was basically before cosplay, mostly just on Halloween, but um, I would design costumes and things, so I, there's a few characters that I've done cosplay of. I've, I've done like uh, Khan from the Wrath of Khan, and I've done um, you know Gene Simmons from Kiss, and, and even like my brother uh, would always throw, because he was born in the same year that Saturday Night Live premiered, so every time he has a big birthday, they do like a Saturday Night Live, and he's also in October, so they would do a big masquerade Saturday Night Live where you dress up as Saturday Night Live characters. So I dressed up as, I think it's Gene Finkel? Is that, I forgot his name, but it's basically the the character, the, the more cowbell character that uh, Will Ferrell played. So I did him, but I thought it might be cool just to get the pop characters of some of the characters that I dressed up as for Halloween. Just, I don't know. I just But that's the thing. I mean, there's so many things. You don't have to collect all pops and everything. And, and and it just, I guess speaking to collectors, I mean, I've never been a person to collect things because I thought they were going to be worth something. I kind of, the things I did collect, I collect, like, I've got comics and things, but I've got comics that are worth nothing uh, that I wouldn't, and even if they were worth something, I don't know that I would sell them because I, I have an attachment to them and I want to keep them. Like, stuff that's based on old toy lines I had as a kid um, that I just wouldn't part with. So if, if I was going to collect something, it would just be for me. I don't know if I would ever sell it. Um, and I, you know, not to get too much into this, but, you know, I don't know that, that Pops are a good investment because I don't know that there's just so many of them and I don't know. I, they may go the way of Beanie Babies. That's what a lot of people are saying. But if you're just buying them because you like them, um, it's not going to matter if they lose value because they're worth something to you. And that's kind of my, you know, my take on collecting and everything. But anyway, for, for what it's worth, I've kind of changed my, my mindset on Funko and Funko Pops. And, and uh, I, next time I walk through a big or see a big wall of Funkos, I won't, won't kind of just kind of turn my head or whatever. I might even take a look at them and have a little greater appreciation. And, and again, that's not all Funko does. They've got one thing I really like is the reaction figure lines, which are based on the look of the old Kenner Star Wars toys, specifically based on the alien toys that they were going to launch, but then parents found out that they were based on a rated R movie and it didn't make much sense to do that, so they kind of killed the line, but they still had the prototypes, so they modeled their line of reaction figures after that, which are similar to the Star Wars figures. So I just thought that was, I just thought that was really, those, that line is really cool how they kind of have these modern toys or even some of the things they never made toys of in the style. And, and they're always launching new things and everything. And I don't know, I, I think it's cool, you know, whereas before I was kind of like, eh, but now I, I'm kind of, I'm starting to, I'm starting to dig the, uh, the whole Funko thing. So <laughs> if you're not a big Funko fan, let me know. But uh, but yeah, I wasn't either, and now now I'm starting to it's, I'm starting to come around. So anyway, those are some of my thoughts on uh, Funko and pop vinyls and all the other stuff that they do and nostalgia and and all that kind of stuff, character designs and trademarks and and just the kind of stuff I'm into and how you know sometimes there's something that you you may not really appreciate or may not like until you learn a little more about that and you and you start to start to kind of gain an appreciation for that. But anyway, I want to know what you guys think. Are you guys into pop vinyls? Are you into Funko Pops, are you into the company Funko, other things that they make, other collectibles. What are you guys into or not into? Let me know in the comments section and I will see you guys later. That is all. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me here in the Art Lab. There's a lot of other great content on the channel, so click that subscribe button and you won't miss a thing. If you're an aspiring evil genius, visit surfworks.com for all your mad science supply needs. And if you want to contact me, hit me up in the comments section or follow me on social media. I'm looking forward to it. I'll see you then.